Hello and welcome to today's webinar on using New England probate records. My name is Geneva Morse, the Director of Education and Online Programs at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist at NEHGS. David has been on staff since 1993 and has written several articles for the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, the New Hampshire Genealogical Record, Rhode Island Roots, The Mayflower Descendant, and American Ancestors Magazine. He is also the author of A Guide to Massachusetts Cemeteries. David is an elected fellow of the Massachusetts Historical Society in Boston, and a life member of the New Hampshire Society of the Cincinnati. David's genealogical expertise includes specialties in New England and Atlantic Canadian research, military records, and Native American and African American genealogical research. You can also hear David every week on the online radio show and podcast, Extreme Genes. Today, David will be discussing how probate records can assist you in your family history research. He will provide a few examples of various probate files and what you're likely to find. He'll also show you how to search New England probate records on our website, AmericanAncestors.org, and what resources you can find here at the NEHGS Library and Archives. Of course, today's discussion will focus on resources for New England, that is Connecticut, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont, but some of the information and techniques that you pick up today uh, may certainly help you in other areas of the country as well. At any point during the presentation, feel free to type a question in the panel to the right of your screen, and we'll address those after the presentation. There is no handout for uh, today's session, but I do encourage you to explore our online subject guides that do uh, contain information about probate records based on geographic location or time period. You can also click on the icon of a camera in the upper right hand of your screen to take screen captures. And we are recording this event, so starting tomorrow you can easily go back and review any of the content from today's presentation. All right, so without further ado, I will now turn things over to David. Thank you, Ginevra, and welcome to today's webinar on New England probate records and getting the most out of a probate record that will be applicable to probably any United States or Canadian, for that matter, European research you do. A lot of the traditions of the old world were carried over here to the shores of America, and of course, our ancestors um, have a variety of different records to search and probate is just one of them um, that I find most useful. Um, probate records are located in a variety of different places between being online, still in courthouses, some have been transcribed, some have been lost to fire and neglect, but I think that if the adventure of your genealogy involves probate records you'll be even more fulfilled. All right, let's first start, before I go into what holdings NEHGS has here at the library in Boston uh, and what we have online on AmericanAncestors.org, I'd like to talk a little bit about probate records because most people think of just last will and testaments. So why use probate records first off? Well, these records are often used to provide vital genealogical evidence for family relationships. In fact, in many cases, they offer the only evidence to connect uh, a parent with their child, or even better yet, give a connection across uh, back to England. Uh, maybe a person came over to New England early on, and in their probated mentions, I leave to my brother now living in London. Uh, or and vice versa, uh, the great genealogist Henry Fitzgobert Waters uh, was sent across in the 19th and early 20th centuries to look at New English probate records that made reference back to family still living in New England. So that relationship and the movement of people um, can be definitely researched and uh, gleaned from probate records. Probate records also offer a glimpse into the personal family relationships and the dynamics of uh, the intertwined positive and negative family relationships too. And it also gives you the personal possessions of our ancestors. Basically, you find out who got what, and sometimes you find out why they didn't get it. Um, oftentimes, you'll find that uh, a probate may say, I leave five pounds to my daughter Elizabeth and 10 pounds 
to my daughter Hannah, and then it goes on to, and to my daughter Mary, I have already given her her fair portion. So maybe there's a reason behind it. Sometimes it even goes into, I leave nothing to a particular child or relative. Now the other issue here is that many published genealogies uh, never went into the bother of searching probates and deeds. Now this could have been for a couple of reasons. One, the author of the genealogy, for instance, 19th and early 20th century genealogist, may have not been able to get to the probate court. Someone living out in, uh, say, Ohio, may have not been able to research all the records in New Hampshire and did it simply by correspondence. The other reason is because old handwriting uh, is sometimes very difficult to reason, read, and these handwritten documents are often a challenge overlooked by genealogists, both ones that are very well trained and ones that are just having a little bit of difficulty. The early 17th century with secretarial hand can be very difficult, of course, to add in a foreign language on top of that in general, or probate, people may be discouraged to do that, but please don't let that be a discourage uh, on your research, because this brick wall can be helped by any HGS. If you can come into the library, uh, our reference staff at the desk are often glad to sit down and try to help you transcribe and make, make a sense of some of the wording or the probate that you're looking at to try to figure out names in it. We also, even to go further, have a consultation service that you can use, hire us to help sit down and read the whole probate with you, or if it's a very large project, you might consider our research service department for helping you in that as well. Okay, one of the tips I want to toss out, and this is really kind of two-part, not everyone had a probate record. Now, that being said, you'd be surprised that a lot of people have that attitude that, well, my ancestor had to leave something. Maybe they died without writing a will. Maybe their estate was just passed on to the oldest children or the surviving spouse through her dower right. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit. But also, don't assume because you think your ancestor may have not been wealthy that they did not leave something. Even the smallest of estates may have had some property, uh, either real or personal, uh, that had to be divided up. So do check those probate indexes for the counties. And also be aware that county boundaries do change. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we break into the particular uh, parts of New England. Now the various different probate cases that you're going to come across, like I say, a lot of people just think of last will and testaments. Uh, they're far more than just that. This includes, of course, wills, the inventories. Now an inventory is oftentimes one of the key documents that you'll find in an administration when someone does intestate, um, listing all of the assets of the estate, both personal as in movable items, like spinning wheels, chests, uh, tools, etc., cetera, uh, as well as real estate. Uh, you may come across divisions, you may come across guardianships, and that would be both for children and for other members of the household. We'll talk a little bit more about that. You may find that your ancestor was a spendthrift. Uh, yeah, the details of that are very enlightening. Uh, you may have an ancestor who had uh, mental illness and or they have been um, an older relative that may have had dementia and unfortunately they, they pull under the same as a lunatic guardianship or they'll say the person is non compass mentis. Um, there's also lunatic commitments in probate files where the person is committed to a state agency. There's agreements in probate cases being the divisions of um, how the estate will be divided. Dower rights, uh, we'll talk about that. Intestate probate, when the person has died without living, leaving a will. A uh, sale is a sale of a particular item as brought to the probate court, which you might think of just via deeds, but that sometimes went through the probate court early on. There, of course, are adoptions and also divorces. The most common probate that's searched for and is often transcribed and put into genealogies are the last will and testaments. As you can see, the one in front of you here is pretty easy to read. Um, it lays out the person's uh, bequest to their family, that they want their soul committed to God, uh, and that they want a decent Christian burial, etc. And the language at the beginning opening paragraph, with some exceptions, almost speaks the same, uh, which is very helpful if you're trying to get to the meat and 
uh, of the actual document. Now, searching through here, if the person is not leaving something to a spouse, they may allude to um, the oldest child. Maybe there is um, a division in the family, maybe the family had separated, maybe there's a, a nephew that's being getting is receiving the probate. Um, so this is where you have to read line by line and transcribe out the who and the what. Um, I find that when you are dissecting a probate from a last will and testament, you're going to search for the names that are familiar to you, but also search for all the names. There might be names of uh, males that you don't understand, but they could turn out to be son-in-laws. So do transcribe the, everything and then dissect the names. I find bolding the names as you do your transcription is very helpful. Now that being said, not all wills are the same. Now what we just looked at was a written will, and that could also be tan typed. It could be a partial filled out form. Uh, as the 19th century went forward, uh, these were um, expanded upon uh, into making it more simpler. Um, you may find that you have a holographic will. A holographic will was written entirely by hand and then signed. You may find a non cupative will. A non cupative will is a verbal will that will have at least two witnesses. And these are often considered a deathbed will, if you will. Take, for instance, if your ancestor was in the Revolutionary War and they were injured on the battlefield, they were carried back and they wanted to leave their expressed uh, wishes for their estate. So two witnesses would hear this verbal will, a deathbed will, if you will, uh, and they'll write down the details and then of course, the person may have died before being able to sign it, uh, or a proper will couldn't have been uh, put forth. So this is why you'll find these occasionally. And then, of course, a codicil is an amendment to a will. It doesn't mean it has to be an exact copy. It just might mean that a new grandchild is born to the family, and they want to leave a percentage of the estate to that person, and they don't want to rewrite the entire will. So look for codicils to wills. It's very important to look at those. Now, why check an inventory? Now, obviously, with a person who dies in test state, there's no written will. Uh, they're not leaving specific things. But if you look closely at inventories, you'll often get a glimpse as to um, who might have obtained things. They even often say in it that this item will be going to this person, or they might even separate the inventory that these items went to this daughter. Now, normally, it's just an accounting. It's an accounting of the real estate and the personal belongings of the deceased. And uh, in an administration, this is really the most valuable document, in my opinion. What we're looking at here is a 1691 probate for Robert Claflin. Uh, this comes from Wenham, Massachusetts. And this is actually an outline of his inventory. Uh, it goes in here, the first line you can see is to his house uh, and the acreage of his land, talks about his livestock, his cows, and descriptions of them, and then it gets into a variety of things that you may find kind of boring, but I want you to be interested in all of them because they're going to help you build a better sense of the estate of your ancestor, especially when you start calculating the financial values in today's dollars. Um, the things that may seem insignificant to you, you find an inventory, may turn out to be a treasure later on in your research and add that more detail to the story. Now, not in every case, but once in a while you get a bonus. Now, in Robert Claflin's example, on the lower part of this inventory, I have come across a rather interesting item. If you can see down here below, besides the inventory of all of his belongings, there's an inventory of his children. No, they weren't given up for sale, but they are listed by name and also by age. You can see Daniel, Antipas, Johanna, Elizabeth, etc., and they're giving you their ages. Why is this important? Well, this is an individual who didn't leave a will, so the laying out of his family uh, on this document makes it very unique, but I do see these occasionally that come up, especially in the earlier wills. Now, 
the next thing that I'm going to show you is that from this list, each person got a division of the estate. In this document here, his daughter Abigail Claflin, who is in the listing of the children from before, Abigail is signing that she received her portion from her father's estate. In this case, she made her mark, in this case not an X, but a, a round circle or maybe it's some version of a large uppercase A, and there, of course, is a seal. Then the document is then witnessed by individuals, and one of them is her brother, Antipas Claflin, who makes his mark, which looks like a letter, capital letter A. So these are the type of things that you want to look at in probate docket files. The probate docket itself will have the individual folded documents from the estate. When you look at record book copies, which are often what Family History Library has microfilmed, which is the actual ledgers of the documents transcribed in, you're not going to get a lot of the receipts, only because not the LDS Church had microfilmed them, is that they're not often included in the record book copy. So there's file papers such as this, the original handwritten, and record book. Now the record book is important to look at because oftentimes pages will get lost, uh, separated, and sometimes unfortunately even stolen. Uh, so you want to look at both. They complement each other. So my tip, just to reassert this, is to look at all the receipts in a probate. And most importantly, if the person wrote the will, and their daughters were unmarried at that point in time. Maybe when the will was proved, the daughters were married. You may catch the married name of one of the children, in this case a daughter, that may have not been recorded in the will, or in this case the inventory, but is recorded on one of these valuable receipts. The smallest of pieces of paper can be worth their gold in genealogical evidence. Now, one of the things that you find that happens when a parent dies, uh, often when the husband dies, the mother is not able to care for her children. And often cases, these are large families. So guardianships are assigned. A guardian would be a person of trust that would have a certain uh, occupation, if you will, or financial well-being um, to care for one of the children so it wouldn't be a burden on the mother. Now. Not in every case is it a family member. In some cases, it's a parishioner they go to church with or a neighbor or maybe a tradesman uh, that has a trade that they can go through and make the person an apprentice. So sometimes guardianships and apprenticeships kind of tie in together. Not always. So, so in this case here, we have Hannah Burnham, the widow of John, uh, the widow, and then John Choate, Thomas Burnham, who's a yeoman, all of the community of Ipswich in Massachusetts. And this is for 1737 for the guardianship of an Andrew Burnham. Now, if you go to the next image, what this will show us is that it's a little different than most. The above named Hannah Burnham is nominated to be the guardian for her son. So the nice thing about this is besides being the scene that he's staying in the family and that he has not leaving, so you can almost look at the inventory and see how financially well the family was. If um, items hadn't been sold for debt against the inventory, uh, the family may have had a st uh, stable financial well-being that allowed the child to stay there. And the nice thing about this, it says the child's age is about three years of age and that his father's name was James Burnham, so which isn't spelled out in the earlier one. So guardianships have genealogical value. You just have to dig a little bit into them. Now, not all guardianships are for children. Now, this next one is on a spendthrift. This Samuel Barrett, back in 1840 uh, in Marblehead, Massachusetts, um, had a problem with drink. And he was essentially <laughs> the person in the community that the town fathers even felt that his... Uh, Intolerance to putting down the bottle would be lead to his ruin. So what happened? The court stepped in with the family and with the town advising to have a guardian assigned. Now this guardian um, was actually his brother. So you get the documents that tie into that. And um, the next document is actually the letter from the selectman <laughs> from the actual town complaining that he is uh, of much need and, and may endanger to expose himself uh, to be in ruin 
So here you have an official town document in the probate document. In fact, it would lead me as a genealogist to look back through the town records and the selectmen's minutes to see how this came about and maybe on the town record side what exists on this event. The next document is the actual appointment of the guardian where the brother of the said individual has been assigned to be his uh, caretaker and John Bassett is signing off stating that he is uh, allowing this to be uh, put forth. One would only hope that John's life improved after that. Now another type of um, probate that you see uh, comes up from time to time is a dower right. Um, basically it's a common law which gives a widow the entitlement to her husband's estate when a will is not been written. So essentially maybe he went off to sea uh, and didn't leave a will or he died suddenly. Um, things did of course happen um, unexpectedly and because of this case the wife would be entitled to generally a third of the estate um, and then the other parts would be provided for paying off debt, uh, maybe for settling aside money to care for children, a guardianship if necessary, but this is spells out here about an Abigail Cain, the relic of this individual who is now getting her dower right uh, into the estate. Now of course the, um, the disappointment of finding out your ancestor didn't leave a will does not mean that you should ignore the intestate and probates and the administrations because again the original file papers may have those excellent little receipts in there that give you clues. Um, you may find that your ancestor's estate may have not been as plentiful or more uh, detailed to land that you may have never even known your ancestor had. So I spend a lot of times going through the inventories and detailing out where the property is, um, detailing what the original items in the household are, and sort of on a social anthropological level, see how the whole household fit together. See, well, why did they have land in Maine? They're living in Massachusetts. And investigate that, that will lead me to look at deeds. Um, if you find that your ancestor has um, money owed to him, it may be for work that he or she did uh, in their lifetime that was not paid. Say if they were a carpenter or a seamstress or something like might be something that had not been paid back. So you might get a, uh, an idea of what they did for a living. Um, there's also other things that you're going to see. Uh, you can see how often your ancestor did or not, did not pay their taxes. <laughs> so you're going to get a color that's more than just a name and a date. And this is why I think probates are so very valuable because they do give us this chance to look into the life of our ancestor and their household uh, with a fine tooth comb and get all the details. So don't ignore any names, any figures and facts on the probate. Look at all of them. Okay, well, AmericanAncestors.org, um, which is our website for the New England Historic Genealogical Society, is one of the most amazing places for your research, especially if you can't come into the library. So we have the availability to allow you to see probates right online on our website by logging in for members, and AmericanAncestors.org is the place to do it. So what I'm going to show you now is that you can go about it a couple of different ways. On our website, uh, if you go to Browse, the first option here is going to be Databases. Now this listing of databases will then bring you to a category list. And down in the category list, you will see on the left-hand side that there are a variety of things, such as vital records, cemetery, census, and right here, court records, land, and probate. Currently, we have 31 databases available for you to search. and this will then, by clicking on that, bring you to a listing of some of the 31 available. And for my example today, we're going to be talking about Essex County probate records, uh, file papers. So um, we'll use that in just a minute. But there's also another way that you can uh, make avail to this. If you go back anytime and click on the oak leaf, you'll be brought to the main page for the society. If you go to search instead of browse, search right here you can go to databases and then you can select the database perhaps after you've browsed or maybe it's one of the ones that you've used from time to time. 
I'm going to introduce you to my Revolutionary War ancestor, Captain Jonathan Poor. Uh, I know from looking at other vital records on American ancestors that he died in the year 1807. I used the Massachusetts Vital Record database to 1850. So I know the year of his death. Now, I don't need necessarily to know the year. I could put in a range of years. So say, for instance, you know somebody was alive in the 1810 census and they were not there in 1820, put in that range of years. This, this is not the birth year and the death year. It's kind of like for a probate search, you want to put in the range of years uh, that you believe the person may have been alive and the one ultimately when the person should be dead by. I also selected here into the database Essex County early probate record 1635 to 1681. Now the database that I'm going to go into is actually the probate file papers, which is the next one. So we're just going to click down on the list and I can select that. The actual image itself, when I hit search, will give me the probate file paper, sort of the, the index, if you will, that's telling me that Captain Jonathan Poor has a probate from 1807. This gives me the case number, which is the file of the docket number. 22360. It tells me the physical description of the papers in this case, which are 12 individual pages, and then it goes on to giving me the actual image numbers. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click over and click right on his name, Jonathan Poor, and it gives me a window capture of the actual docket envelope, the file papers are within this file paper, um, excuse me, the file papers are located within this envelope right here, uh, which you can't see obviously, but this is how they are housed. Uh, you can do a variety of things here. You can actually download the image itself. You can print it. And um, I find that clicking on the actual image and for the point of showing you what a probate document looks like on American ancestors, I'm going to use um, screen captures that I've already obtained via this method and um, show you the different documents. So luckily for me, the uh, last will and testament of Captain Jonathan Poor, my fourth great-grandfather, is pretty legible. Um, it goes into itemization of what he's leaving his widow and to all of his children. Uh, including the small amount of property that he left my third great-grandfather. There's a story behind that somewhere, which I haven't fleshed out yet, but he did not receive as much as his other siblings. <laughs> so the last will and testament is right there in front of you. I always like to split screen an image and a word processor and just go line by line verbatim transcribing them. For one, it's going to give you the details that you need from the probate, because chances are this isn't verbatim transcribed anywhere else yet. And secondly, it's a great tutorial for you to learn old handwriting, especially if this is a new uh, adventure for you. And again, if you have trouble with it, ask us. We're more than happy to compare. We can pull up a screen and say, oh, that says the following. Or in some cases, we may be as pu puzzled and perplexed as you, but uh, we can get a second opinion for you. <laughs> Okay, now the other thing that I find that's so valuable with the original file papers versus the record book, if your ancestor did in fact sign the document, you're going to get their signature. Now for me, Jonathan Poor doesn't exist as a portrait or a photograph. Uh, I can go visit his gravestone, but his personal signature there is for me a thumbprint. It's something that's identified to him and I often will create the genealogy sketches I do on my ancestors include the signatures uh, as sort of a visual representation personally of them. The next document is actually created after the effect of Jonathan's writing as well. Now Jonathan wrote his will um, slightly before his death and this right here, his son Samuel, has been assigned the executor, the person who will set forth the wishes of the deceased and make sure that his bills are paid, uh, that his debts owed to him are collected, and that the estate as requested in the will are set forth in his, be, uh, his bequeathed, his bequeathed thing, things to certain children and land, etc., are uh, valuable. And his point of this job is to make sure everything 
goes forward. And he is court appointed by this document. <laughs> this document here goes into um, basically telling us about Samuel being appointed as the executor. And it also gives you the witnesses that are assigned in the estate uh, for him to go forward and make sure that his acts are free and clear. Now these are also people that are involved in doing the inventory often. The inventory itself of the estate for me is really the most interesting besides the will. For me, I have nothing that belonged to the fourth, my fourth great grandfather. Nothing has passed down in my family in the real estate line from our farm that we had well over 200 years ago. So if I look at this and I look at the certain amounts of allotments of land, 40 acres here, a pasture here, an island pasture, I can envision and I can map out where my particular ancestor's land was. The other thing that I would be able to do is now I know that in 1807, he owned this property. Did he receive it from his own father's probate? So there's another project for you. Or is this an inventory that's going to give you the detail enough that you can turn to the deeds or the proprietorship records of a community to figure out when he purchased the property or when he inherited the property? So it, there's more work to be done from this point just in the real estate. Now, for me as a genealogist and having studied anthropology and archaeology, it's it really is a great thing to be able to look um, at who the person was. So in this case, I have an inventory of his clothing. I know his best suit was worth $12. His second one was worth 7 of course, again, remember this is an 1807 money. <laughs> His third suit is worth $4. His fourth suit is worth 3 So here's a man who owned four suits. It goes into his shoe buckles, his boots. And this is really allowing me to kind of peel back the pages of time and look into the household. I'm basically going through his closet, if you will, or his, or his chest to see what items that he actually had. Uh, even more so, beyond clothing, the next inventory are of household furniture. Now the household furniture here talks about his bed. Uh, in some cases, it even tells you what room items are listed in. So you could actually stare through the pane of glass in your ancestor's home and see room by room what was in it and actually kind of visualize. You know, maybe you have an old trunk that was handed down from your ancestor that came across a transatlantic voyage from Europe. You know, where is this trunk now? Do you have it? Does your aunt have it? Or maybe you gave it to a friend and it's living in their garage. So you just never know where the household items have turned up, but for having this list here, family ephemera might be able to be identified. And that mantle clock that you have above your fireplace, if it sounds suspiciously like something from an inventory that you have here by an ancestor, you may have had a clue. I've had things that have turned up in inventories that I wish were still in my ancestor's house, that were rather than say wish or to be in my home, that were in my ancestor's house, but who knows, maybe that's what eBay's for. Okay. Now, the tip that I'd like to show you is to determine the present day value of an estate. Now, obviously you can kind of scratch your head and say, well, how can you do that? Well, let technology and the internet help you. So, in my ancestor's estate, his personal estate was worth uh, $1,099.44. His real estate was worth $6,800 odd, and his total was worth about $8,000. Well, if you use a website called www.measuringworth.com slash P-P-O-W-E-R-U-S, P-Power-Us, I can find out that the purchasing power of my ancestor's estate in 1807 is now currently worth $167,000. Not a bad little 
chunk of change, and it allows me to see from $1,807 right down to the current value. And you can do this with colonial probates as well as uh, early probates uh, in medieval times as well using English pound calculators, which are available on the internet. Okay, now I'd like to take you on a virtual tour, if you will, of uh, NEHGS and what holdings that we have both online and for you at our library. So hopefully if you come to one of our Come Home to New Englands or if you're a frequent visitor at NEHGS, some of this may be new or it may be something that you use all the time. So let's go state by state. First off, I want to throw out a tip that search for published transcriptions of early county probate records before you do an exhaustive search. One, remember the handwriting can often be difficult to read and there's really no point of recreating the wheel uh, and it also saves you time to know if in fact a probate exists. On the fourth floor microtext and technology floor at NEHGS, we have both microfiche and microfilm readers as well as tens to thousands of rolls of microfilm available for you to use. Now I may also add that if you're planning a visit to NEHGS, we can facilitate your rentals from the Family History Library in Salt Lake City. We are one of the places that you can have uh, the microfilm sent when you order them uh, to be available. Do keep in mind the time does vary from uh, weeks to months uh, for if a film isn't available, but uh, this is something that you can do. The other technology that we have is it's not just having to print out a copy or make a transcription while you're looking at a film. You can actually go and digitally scan the microfilm. This technology allows you to place a roll of microfilm onto one of our readers and from there the image will pop up onto the screen and you can select, you can change the contrast, make it lighter or darker, and you can save it as a variety of different images from JPEG to TIFF to PDFs and bring the image home with you on a thumb drive, which you can simply just plug into one of our computers that are adjacent to the reader. In the Microtext department, you'll also find a variety of printed probate indexes that have been compiled from the 19th century well into the 21st century for different probate courts. You'll also find that any HGS as well as New England has a variety of probate indexes and abstracts for over thousands of counties in the United States in Canada that are available on our local history floor on the fifth floor at NEHGS. All right, let's start with Connecticut and I'll give you an overview of what we have. Uh, we have microfilm probate indexes for the whole state from 1648 to 1948. Unfortunately, we don't have the records to 1948, but we do have the file papers that go right up to 1915 and with, of course, the earliest ones starting in 1648. These records are very easy to use and um, I'm going to show you an example, but just keep one tip in mind. This is true for all of New England. County and district boundaries change over time. And you want to confirm the probate boundaries for your town because, for instance, my hometown in Massachusetts, when it was incorporated in 1726, it was part of Suffolk County. Well, less than 80 years later, the county boundary changes and it's now in a completely different county. So if I'm going to research the early families of my community, I have to look at Suffolk County. If I want to look into the 19th century, I'm now looking into a totally different county and different probates and different deeds. So do keep the boundaries in line because if you are looking for multiple families over multiple years, you may get discouraged and say, well, they're not in here. And the problem really is you're just looking at the wrong county. Connecticut is very useful because there is a statewide index, but you can also go uh, into the actual probate districts and look alphabetically um, for the files as well. I always say it's always best, if, especially if you're working on one surname, look at the overall index for Connecticut and you'll get a card that looks like this. This is a probate index card for Joshua Sears, who is in the town of Norwalk in the district of Fairfield. Now Fairfield's going to be the probate district. It now tells me that the docket number is 5501. Well, you don't have to really worry about that so much other than for your citation because the within the Fairfield district itself, the probate file papers are filmed alphabetically. What it will also give you is that you're going to look at two documents. So when this was actually inventoried, 
there were only two documents in the docket, and that includes a will and an inventory. Now, in the file papers themselves, again, these are the originals. Now, you may find that there are missing documents. Now, we do not have the record book copies of the Connecticut file papers. However, these have been oftentimes microfilmed, so you can go and get them. So if you find missing papers, perhaps when the probate was actually handed into the court, another reason why they were copied into the record books, someone may have transcribed that will or put the inventory in there that the document is now mislaid, but you can now find it um, in another source through the record books. In the state of Maine, um, Maine of course is part of Massachusetts, uh, the District of Maine until 1820. Uh, NEHGS has microfilm for the following counties, that include Franklin, Kennebec, Knox, Lincoln, Piscataqua, Somerset, and York, and a combination of both file papers and probate record books. Now, when the Family History Library microfilmed records, there are different filming teams that have gone out over the past few decades, and oftentimes it's availability uh, and also time. If you think about the efforts it would take to open each file docket and lie each document flat, that's a lot of time and effort, and if you're trying to do thousands upon thousands of records, the rationale is, let's get the record books done first, have the records available. And that's what they basically did. If you look into the filmings of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, oftentimes Family History Library did not do the file papers, but did the record books. So they would grab an individual volume, and they would turn page by page, and they would be in there. Luckily, in most cases, there were index, indexes for the volumes, so you don't have to hunt through the whole book to find it. And of course, with now with digital indexing, even if it wasn't, you might find it indexed already. Uh, for the state of Maine, unfortunately, uh, and of course it would have to be my ancestors' county, Cumberland County probates were destroyed by fire in 1909. One of the things that you may want to look at on American ancestors are the transcriptions of the earliest wills for Maine that cover 1640 to 1760. And again, this is a database you can look at at AmericanAncestors.org. Remember to check the probate record books when the file papers are listed as missing. Can't hit this home enough because a lot of people think, well, it must just not exist anywhere. The chances are when the file papers are missing, the record book will have the documents. So I've had many people say, well, I didn't bother looking. Well, do look because that is the backup of why they created the record book copies. Here's an example of the county record book index for one of the places in Maine, where it actually gives you the name of the individual and the individual paginations where you'll find the person. Uh, sometimes it's simply one page, or sometimes it's multiple pages. Now keep in mind, when you look at an index for a record book, the probate will, the last will and testament, may be in one book. Another volume might have the inventory. Another uh, volume might have things that are codicils to the will. They're not all together page by page by page in order. They were put in as they were placed into certain volumes that were set aside for certain types of probate. Um, so you might find the wills are all in one book, the inventories are all in another. In some cases, there's no rhyme or reason to them. But do look at them if you definitely do find missing pages or if you want to find things that you think are not listed in the probate file document, it's good to check them both. So I always advise both. This is an example of one of the pages that's printed in the Lincoln County Maine probate record book. As you can see here, this page is a pagination up here. This is a pre-printed form with just certain pertinent information that relates to the deceased in the filing of their estate. Most of the verbiage, as I say, in probates is identical. So in this case, it's just a filling in the blanks. Now, the original file papers may have some of this handwritten, or some of this may actually be duplicates as a, an actual blank form uh, and not just the page here. Again, for Maine, uh, you definitely want to consult John E. Frost's Maine Probate Abstract, 1687 to 1800. This is a two-volume set published by Picton Press, which is available at NEHGS on our shelves. What this will do for you, it will 
quickly determine the uh, existence and the give you a partial abstracted detail to each one of the cases. So that I know here that Joseph Harmon of York, Maine, uh, and then it goes into mentioning people in the family, uh, and it goes into the financial value. Uh, it gives me here the case that he was a, a mariner. So you might be able to determine quickly, you're looking for Joseph Harmon, you know he's up in that part of Maine. Is this correct? Is Mercy his wife's name? Was he a mariner? Did he live during these particular years? Instead of spending the time reading through record books or pulling file documents, these abstracts when available are very valuable because they can quickly get you yes or no, this is the right person. Then you can seek out the originals. Now in Massachusetts, we have microfilm or probates from the 17th through the 19th century for all counties in Massachusetts. Uh, we have printed indexes for Essex County, Middlesex, Norfolk, Plymouth, Suffolk, and Worcester. Online, we currently have Barnstable County probate abstracts from 1685 to 1789. Then we have the file papers. And in uh, this collaboration with the Supreme Judicial Court Archives and Family History Library, we have been able to put some very valuable papers for the first time. For instance, my ancestors are from Essex County. I had only been able to request the Essex County file papers by writing to the archives. Now I can simply look at 1638 to 1881 online, as you saw with my example with Jonathan Poor. Also, there is Hampshire County probate from 1660 to 1858, Middlesex from 1648 to 1871, Plymouth County, 1686 to 1881, and Worcester, 1731 to 1881. And they're also online, we have indexes for Norfolk, Suffolk, and Worcester. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. There'll be more to come for Massachusetts as well as for other parts of New England in the near future. For New Hampshire, probates to 1771 are abstracted in the New Hampshire State Papers, volumes 31 to 39. On this URL right here, you can actually go to and look at the actual volume. So anything prior to 1771 has already been abstracted and transcribed for you in part. So this is very valuable. I also want you to advise you to come and look at the original file papers, which NEHGS has on microfiche. NEHGS has microfilm and microfiche for both Belknap, Carroll, Cheshire, Coaz, Grafton, Hillsborough, Merrimack, Rockingham, Stratford, and Sullivan counties, and the microfiche of the provincial probate file papers pre-1771. Now, if you look at in New Hampshire, for anything prior to 1771, you'll also see it cross-referenced as Rockingham County, because prior to that, uh, everything is referred to Rockingham and Maine. Everything prior to 1760 is York. So a couple of key things that might be valuable to you. Now, the New Hampshire State Papers series, uh, these probate records, um, are going to be uh, very valuable. And this set here, this is from volume 31 of the series, again, available right online for you to look at, is a transcription of the last will and testament of Godfrey Dearborn of Hampton, New Hampshire in 1680. Uh, again, if you're having trouble with old handwriting, this may be the clear answer for you that you can actually look at this and then seek out the original. And by the way, this is now uh, a primer for you to actually use an old document that's been transcribed, pull up a, a digital copy from our microfilm or microfiche and run it against it and see how well your transcription uh, is. So do it as a test for yourself, as well as saving you a little bit of stress and aggravation looking at old records. Now the index itself for New Hampshire um, are available on microfilm, the Provincial Probate Index. And this right here tells me my ancestor, William Pittman, uh, this is an inventory of his estate. And there are also a variety of other documents. But what's interesting about this, it both gives me the record book volume and page, as well as the original number to his file docket. In the original file docket, besides the inventory that's mentioned here, there's actually a page for his last will and testament. Now the next tip, there should be a probate file and a probate record book copy of each case. Now in most cases when their fire occurs, both are usually lost. But again, with probate record books, you get the limitation that not everything is copied into it. But the saving grace of this is that the file papers, if something is lost, will be duplicated in the record books. 
On microfiche, the will of William Pittman uh, from 1699 is available. The quality is pretty good. Um, the, I'm able to use our digital scanner and I can clear the contrast up uh, pretty nicely and I can zoom in on certain words. Uh, one thing that's nice about having a digital copy of any image that you've copied from our microfilm or microfiche is that you can manipulate it with a high resolution scan to help reading and occasionally you have ink that's blurred in so they may be a little tough to read so having that added technological advantage is a plus. In Rhode Island probate, NEHGS owns microfilm of town probate records for about half of the Rhode Island towns. They're on the town level versus uh, available on the county. NEHGS has an online index to Providence probate from 1646 to 1899. Now this index looks simply like a published index. I showed you a screenshot of some of the indexes on the fourth floor microfilm uh, floor. And uh, in Microtext, this is one of the indexes we have, but it's also available online. And this image shows you the um, probate holdings for Providence. Go to the next image. Here we go. So here we have the Smiths with the date of the probate, the type of the probate case itself, and the file number. This would be for the dockets. Now using that docket number, I can then go to a probate cross-reference index microfilm at any HGS, and here's my number. They're arranged this way. <clears throat> and then it tells me the year of the event, the particular document in the estate file. But besides having the docket, I also now have the volume in the page so I can find the record book copy. Oftentimes, this is a quick way to cross-reference. Uh, you may find that there's an index that's available from the Family History Library that's been microfilmed that gives both, uh, and this is definitely an added bonus. So if you don't have the file papers, you have the number here in front of you. You can actually contact the court or the town uh, and have a copy made for you. The last state we're going to talk about is Vermont, and Vermont, we have all of the probate districts on microfilm, so you don't need to order any. You can just come down to any HGS and take a peek at them. We don't have them currently online yet. However, these record books on the probate districts are available on microfilm. As you can see here is an inventory of the estate of Henry Walbridge. Uh, late of Bennington, who uh, died at, back in 1778, talk about a yoke of oxen, the value. So on a particular page, there may be multiple separations of multiple probates. So that whole page isn't often uh, Henry Walbridge in this case. It may be for another probate, and it ends with one and starts up with another. Um, so Again, contact the town and the uh, probate districts are going to have the actual file papers as well. In this case, they had just not been microfilmed. Now, as I've said, NEHS is more than just New England, uh, and that's true. And we kind of did the coverage here just to talk about our New England holdings. But on American Ancestors, again, remember any time on our website, click back to the oak leaf. You can go to searching our library catalog, and you can do a keyword search um, for putting in probate and the county uh, that you're looking for. You can see if we actually have the holdings. Uh, again, for thousands of counties across the U.S. and Canada, you'd be surprised we have a very good complement of these type of records. Again, not available online, but when you do come to any HGS, you might find this something that you can use. Well, I hope that this overview has been uh, useful, and I'm going to turn this over to Geneva and any questions you have. All right. Thank you, David. So as he said, now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything that you'd like to ask, go ahead and type it in the questions panel. And uh, David will answer as many as he can in the time provided. Um, so David, we have a, a question from Wendy. She says that she's new to probate research, and she asks if you can um, if you can explain again the difference between record books versus probate files. Okay, Wendy. Well, when you write your last will and testament years ago, it's on a handwritten document, and of course, there may be additional things, and after you have passed away, you will have an inventory. Now, these documents themselves are folded up generally and put into uh, an envelope or a file docket, if you will, and these are the original file papers associated with your estate. 
When the file papers come to the court, a record book copy is put together. Now what basically happens is they'll take the key documents, the last will and testament, the inventory, any codicils of the will, and they'll open a ledger book. And in these record books or ledger books, they will transcribe verbatim what is on your last will and testament, what is on your inventory, what is on your codicils of your will. That way, if for some reason the file papers got lost, destroyed, or mislaid, there was a court copy of them to be referred to. All right. Um, now, Shirley asks about um, guardianships and, you know, when you first uh, spoke about guardianships um, and she asks if you would advise looking into the history of that particular guardianship to see what any uh, restriction, any restrictions, um, what what restrictions might have been um, in setting it up. In a guardianship, um, one of the things that you often find is a cash amount that is set aside for the caring or a bond, if you will, that the person has financial means to help care for that person. Now, that may be directly uh, by association of being a relative and their just love and affection, or it could be a dollar amount that has been um, restricted from the uh, revenue of the estate. Um, one of the things that you'll find is that oftentimes, as a child uh, progresses uh, in their life to becoming an adult, they may have assigned, asked the court to be assigned another guardian. So that does occasionally happen. Maybe the guardian dies or maybe they're mishandling the money. So you look into these guardianship documents and it's often not just one or two sheets of paper. It sometimes can go into a very detailed and sometimes hostile <laughs> inventory of what, what has gone on. And just to continue the conversation of guardianships, uh, Victoria asks about um, well, how to access more recent probate records. Um, she asks uh, specifically about guardianships post-1911 in Massachusetts. For Massachusetts, every county is set up with their own rules and restrictions and limitations by budget. Um, I'm often finding in Massachusetts, counties will have an index online of more recent probate files. Uh, for instance, Suffolk County, I can go and pull up a computerized index of things that have occurred in the past uh, couple of decades. It's that gray area between the time that the Family History Library or whomever has filmed the records and when they're uh, available. Now, there is no reason a guardianship should be restricted, for instance, or a last will and testament. Adoptions are restricted. Um, obviously for the means that to protect the child and the adopted parents and the person who is the natural parents. Um, but any other document, you can go into any county court in Massachusetts, uh, inquire using our New England handbook or just uh, calling the court to find out what is off-site. Um, for instance, Suffolk County has certain years of records and docket file numbers that you wouldn't know offhand that are located in an off-site facility that they need a day or so to have the records pulled. So if you've come from a long distance, do your homework ahead of time. But you won't have any problem looking at guardianships. Often there will be a printed record book or a computer database that will allow you to quickly see the docket number that you need and then you make a request, often giving a photo ID at the window of any court. And they, the wait time is usually, I mean, again, if it's on site, just a matter of minutes uh, or less than a half hour. Now, Peggy asks about the availability of the various databases that we showed um, on AmericanAncestors.org, if those are only available to members or if they're available um, free and open to the public. Um, I can certainly answer that. Uh, so certainly all of our databases are available to members, um, and you can learn more about membership on our website at AmericanAncestors.org slash join. Um, but we also have a guest user program, which um, allows access to, I think, Currently, it's about 32 uh, databases, and a number of those are probate uh, databases, especially for the state of Massachusetts. Um, so like the Essex County uh, file papers that, um, that David used as an example when searching his ancestor, Jonathan Poor, that is a free database. So you could certainly, um, you don't have to be a member to search that, um, but of course, there are 
you know, I think we have 32 free databases and we have 453 databases total. So um, just to put in a plug, it's certainly worth becoming a member, but you can at, at least as a start search um, our free databases and see what we have. So let's see, we're running out of time, but maybe just a few more questions. Um, now, Nancy asks if you could kind of explain probate districts for the states of New England. I know each state is different. Could you just kind of run through each state and whether it's a probate district, if it's by town or if it's by county? Okay, for Vermont and Connecticut, you deal with probate districts. Um, these are districts that are set up in boundaries that may even cover multiple counties. Um, it's just the way the district is drawn out. Ironically, Connecticut settled Vermont, so I can see where the practice actually probably carried forth. For Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island, where the probate records are housed in a county courthouse, uh, the probate court, uh, not to be confused with the Registry of Deeds, even though they could be in the same building, uh, the Register of Probate and the Register of Deeds operate separately. And maybe just one last question before ending it today. Um, a few people have asked about divorce records. Um, where are those typically held um, and what do we have either on AmericanAncestors.org or here at the library? We have indexes for Suffolk County, for instance, for um, marital abolishments, <laughs> if you will. Uh, in Massachusetts, it was uh, the early 1920s where the county government took over um, the handling of divorces. Before that, it was the Supreme Judicial Court, and that goes back to colonial days. Divorce records are different on state by state. For instance, we have a microfilm index, uh, 19th century to early 20th century, for Maine divorces. Uh, you're going to find that in some cases, just simply putting in divorce and then the state into our catalog will give you an, a listing of our holdings. Uh, the New England Handbook, which I've mentioned uh, before, uh, that will actually help you uh, gauge you where the divorce records are, or simply feel free to give us a call at the library and we can aid you to pinpoint the particular time frame and where you need to write or go to get these records. And there are so many good questions uh, left unanswered. I will ask just one more. I promise this is the last one. And the question is um, regarding uh, uh, proving dates. So when is a will proved? Is there a typical interval between death and when a will is proven? Um, and also, uh, how do you know what that date is? Well, I mean, for instance, if I wrote a will today and I didn't change my will, no codicils, um, the date that it's proved is when it's actually brought to the court by my, dis my, uh, my heirs. Now, for whatever reason that may be, say if I die, if this is in the colonial period and I died in England, my will is there, but my property and my estate is back here in Boston, it may be a matter of months. So one of the things that I find, if you look in the early New England genealogies, especially the work by Robert Charles Anderson in the Great Migration, you may have a date where it says the will was written and then the will was proved. Now the will being proved in this case is when the inventory was taken because they're not going to do the inventory of a living person. So we know that they died between that span of dates. I mean, generally speaking, you're probably dealing with a family that had a, uh, a widow uh, or children that the estate had to be settled. If you had debts against your estate, obviously people wanted to be paid. Uh, if you had debts owed to your estate to help maintained it to keep it going, uh, you would want to collect on those soon after. So I would say that generally it's within a month, month and a half. I mean, there are obviously exceptions, but that's the rule that I've seen in most of the cases with my ancestor. It's usually you know a couple of weeks after the person died. Uh, again, keep in mind when the person died, what time of year is it? Is it the winter? Can they get to the court? You know, I mean, obviously people are going to make a, a good effort, but winter time uh, may be a little bit longer versus uh, better weather, uh, especially in New England in the spring and the summer and the fall. All right. Um, 
Thank you again for all your questions. Um, if you'd like help with the specifics of your research project, you may consider scheduling a one-on-one -on -one consultation with an expert at NEHGS. Those can be done either um, in person here at the library or over the phone. And to schedule such a consultation, you can write to consultations at nehgs.org. If you need help breaking down a proverbial brick wall, we also offer research for hire. So if you're interested in learning more about that service, you can contact research at nehgs.org. So thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback on this presentation. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center at AmericanAncestors.org slash education. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now. Hello and welcome to today's